Video number six, Common Sense by Thomas Paine. Another evil which attends hereditary succession is that the throne is subject to be possessed by a minor at any age, all which time the regency, acting under the cover of a king, have every opportunity and inducement to betray their trust. The same national misfortune happens when a king, wore out with age and infirmity, enters the last stage of human weakness. In both these cases, the public becomes a prey to every miscreant who can tamper successfully with the follies, <clears throat> either of age or infancy. The most possible plea which had ever been offered in favor of hereditary succession is that it preserves a nation from civil wars, and were this true, it would be weighty, whereas it is the most barefaced falsity ever imposed upon mankind. The whole history of England disowns the fact. <clears throat> Thirty kings and two minors have reigned in the distracted kingdom since the conquest, in which time there had been, including the revolution, no less than eight civil wars and nineteen rebellions. Wherefore, instead of making for peace, it makes against it and destroys the very foundation it seems to stand on. The contest for monarchy and succession between the houses of York and Lancaster laid England in a scene of blood for many years. Twelve pitched battles besides skirmishes and sages were fought between Henry and Edward. Twice was Henry prisoner to Edward, who in his turn was a prisoner to Henry. And so uncertain is the fate of war and the temper of a nation, when nothing but personal matters are the ground of a quarrel, that Henry was taken in triumph from a prison to a palace, and Edward obliged to fly from a palace to a foreign land. Yet as sudden transitions of temper are seldom lasting, Henry in his turn was driven from the throne, and Edward recalled to succeed him the Parliament always following the strongest side. This contest began in the reign of Henry the Sixth, and was not entirely extinguished until Henry the Seventh, in whom the families were united, including a period of sixty-seven years, viz. from 1422 to 1489. In short, monarchy and succession have laid, not this or that kingdom only, but the world in blood and ashes, is a form of government which the word of God bears testimony against, and blood will attend it. If we inquire into the business of a king, we shall find that in some countries they have none, and after sauntering away their lives without pleasure to themselves or advantage to the nation, withdraw from the scene and leave their successors to tread the same idle round. In absolute monarchies, the whole weight <clears throat> a business, civil, and military lies on the king. The children of Israel, in their request for a king, urge this plea that he may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. But in countries where he is neither a judge nor a general, as in England, a man would be puzzled to know what is his business. The nearer any government approaches to a republic, the less business there is for a king. It is somewhat difficult <clears throat> to find a proper name for the government of England. Sir William Meredith calls it a republic, but in its present state it is worthy of the name <clears throat> because the corrupt influence of the crown by having all the places in its disposal has so effectually swallowed up the power and eaten out the virtue of the House of Commons, the Republican part in the Constitution, that the government of England is nearly as monarchical as that of France or Spain. Men fall out with names without understanding them, for it is the republican and not the monarchical part of the Constitution of England which Englishmen glory in, viz. the liberty of choosing a House of Commons from out of their own body, and it is easy to see that when republican virtue fails, slavery ensues. <coughs> Why is the Constitution of England sickly? But because monarchy hath poisoned the Republic, the crown has engrossed the commons. In England a king hath little more to do 
than to make war and give away places, which in plain terms is to impoverish, impoverish the nation and set it together by the ears. A pretty business indeed for a man to be allowed 800,000 sterlings a year for and worshipped in the bargain? A more worth is one honest man to society and in the sight of God than all the crown ruffians that have ever lived. <coughs> <clears throat> Thoughts on the present state of American affairs. In the following pages, I offer nothing more than simple facts, plain arguments, and common sense, and have no other preliminaries to settle with the reader than that he will divest himself of prejudice and prepossession, and suffer his reason and his feelings to determine for themselves that he will put on, or rather that he will not put off, the true character of a man and generously enlarge his views beyond the present day. Volumes have been written on the subject of the struggle between England and America. Men of all ranks have embarked on the controversy from different motives and with various designs, but all have been ineffectual and the period of debate is closed. <clears throat> Arms as a last resource decide the contest. The appeal was the choice of the king and the continent has accepted the challenge. It has been reported of the late Mr. Pelham, who, though an able minister, was not without his faults, that on his being attacked in the House of Commons on the score that his measures were only of a temporary kind, replied, They will last my time. Should a thought so fatal and unmanly possess the colonies in the present contest, the name of ancestors will be remembered by future generations with detestation. <clears throat> the sun never shined on a cause of greater worth. Tis not the affair of a city, a country, a province, or a kingdom, but of a continent, of at least one-eighth part of the habitable globe. Tis not the concern of a day, a year, or an age. Prosperity was virtually involved in the contest, and will be more or less affected even to the end of time by the proceedings now. Now is the seed time of continental union, faith, and honor. The least fracture now will be like a name engraved with the point of a pen on a tender rind of a young oak. The wound will enlarge with the tree and prosperity read it in full-grown characters. <clears throat> By referring the matter from argument to arms, a new era for politics is struck. A new method of thinking has arisen. All plans, proposals, and etc. prior to the 19th of April to the commencement of the hostilities are like the almanacs of the last year, which, though proper then, are superseded and useless now. Whatever was advanced by the advocates on either side of the question then terminated in one and the same point, viz. a union with Great Britain, the only difference between the parties was the method of effecting it, the one proposing force, the other friendship. But it hath so far happened that the first hath failed, and the second have, has withdrawn her influence. And we'll go to the next one.